All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our SOA talk for this, this semester. For this one, we have Christian Dixon, a senior in history major, and he will be giving his talk over failure to imitate a perfect God. So let's all give him a round of applause. Um, so thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate um, an audience, especially on a topic that's very near and dear to me, um, Protestant Christianity in the Holocaust. Um, I was drawn to this topic in Dr. Schofield's History of the Holocaust Research Seminar class in the fall of 2021, um, because I was raised in a Protestant Christian household, um, and I was always intrigued by how an individual's religious convictions would motivate them to either act or not act in a certain situation. Um, in my research, um, I found a few different points of discussion that were particularly interesting. First, how a group of individuals who claim to follow a perfect God would allow a um, regime that is so oppressive in the periphery of society um, to come to power, and whether or not there were individuals in that society who opposed the same regime, um, how the opposition appeared to those who were oppressed by the regime. Um, I looked into the mobilization of individual Protestant Christians, and I found that there's an inverse relationship between an individual's status within the hierarchy of a church and their likelihood of actually engaging with um, the Jewish population or the ethnic minority population of Europe. Um, I also found that there was the emergence of a narrative of Christian persecution under the Nazi regime um, that in some respects almost parallel that of Jewish persecution um, during the Holocaust. So I think um, a, a quote that encapsulated sort of the, the driving factors of my discussion was from a poem by Martin Niemöller. He was a Lutheran theologian um, in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and his poem from the first they came concluded with, they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. And I think my initial reaction to seeing this poem was, um, Nee Muller was um, acknowledging his need for repentance, that he did not um, stand up for the least of these. He did not advocate for those who were pressed down in society. And he is almost reaping the, the benefit, or the, the reward, not the reward, he's reaping the consequences of that. Um, but I also realized in my, 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 my research and my paper that there's almost this comparison of suffering um, in Nee Muller's work, in his um, discussion of guilt, that maybe the Christians under the German occupation, um, under the Nazi regime, maybe they suffer the same as the Jewish population or as the Centi Roma or of the homosexual population. And um, as, as my research has found, that was actually not true. There was a 98% population of Catholic and Protestant Germans um, at the rise of the Nazi seizure of power. Um, but following the end of the First World War, Germans were reeling from the, the defeats, um, the humiliation that they felt on the European continents. And so the, the need for justification from the soul, from the national standpoint, from the political standpoints, um, really allowed for Hitler's traditionalist values to seep into politics, to seep into religion. Um, so there was the emergence of this German Christian movement that was essentially a pro-Nazi religious organization um, it wasn't necessarily the majority of Protestant churches in Germany, but it was a significant part um, that focused almost extensively on the German Volk, the, the encapsulation of religion and economics and culture and language and nationality that made Germany itself. Um, these German Christians would almost preach off of a propagandist uh, textbook rather than preaching out of the Gospels uh, in the New Testament. And there is a premium placed on a sort of masculine Christianity. Your favor with God was dependent on your ability to lead your household as a husband, your ability to serve in your occupation, your ability to um, perform in battle. Um, and these German Christians um, reconciled the fact that they were, you know, descendants of this, or they were followers of this Messiah by removing any Jewish connection to his, to his name. So they're, they're, um, their logic behind this was that Jesus was crucified by Jews, so he could not have been a Jew himself because he was in conflict with them. So they were justified in throwing out the Old Testament, throwing out the, the doctrines that Jews used to practice in their, in their texts and in their, um, their walks of life. Um, and this allowed for open anti-Semitism to kind of pervade these German Christian churches. 
Um, if you were a clergy member and you were found to not be of Aryan ancestry, you were removed from power. Um, if you were an Aryan um, congrega congregational member who married a non-Aryan, um, you were removed from the congregation as well. Um, so there is very much this um, willingness to adopt anti-Semitic um, rhetoric and policies that the Nazis kind of propagated as well. Um, the German Christians were so enthusiastic about support for Hitler and his um, regime that the Nazis had to actually distance themselves from the German Christians. Um, these churches would have the Nazi banner hanging behind the pulpits. They would have swastikas uh, on their altars, and they would use Nazi propaganda in their messaging. And Hitler hated this so much that he essentially gave them a cease and desist telling that they couldn't affiliate themselves with the Nazi party, um, which is intriguing because Hitler himself didn't adamantly hate religion, but he didn't want there to be a, um, a power struggle for his authority and God's authority. He saw the church as being either the biggest ally to him in his seizure of power or the biggest threat to his power. That if there was a concentrated denouncement of his um, deportations, of his um, discrimination towards the ethnic Jews and ethnic minorities, then he would have to back down, essentially. And the individuals who came to be known as the confessing church were that, um, that thin line between um, pro-Nazi Christians and um, those who were on the periphery. Um, they were against the idea of a state-sponsored church that Hitler himself proposed and that the German Christian movement hoped to adopt. Their, um, their, law, their, um, their moniker came from the Theological Declaration of Parliament, which said that there's only one gospel, there's only one um, proclamation for, for God and man, and that does not include Hitler, it does not include Germany, um, that does not include the swastika. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was probably the most well-known um, of these um, Protestant uh, ministers who opposed Hitler. He um, was actually ultimately arrested and executed for being implicated in the assassination plot for Hitler. Uh, but he was quoted as saying that the church has only one altar, the altar of the Almighty, before which all creatures must kneel. So essentially he's saying that there is not a national church, there is not a, um, a church of ethnicity, there's not a church of blood relation, it's a church where everybody is prostrate before the, the universal God. Um, the Confessing Church and Dietrich Bonhoeffer were advocates of defending the little ones. Um, this was a biblical concept stating um, those in the eyes of the world who have no worth, whom the world pushes aside, from whom people walk away, about whom no one inquires, Jesus stands up for the life of the weak, sick, and the vulnerable. So the Confessing Church hoped to be sort of the vanguard between Nazi German um, nationalism and then those who didn't quite fit the mold with that. Um, we saw this as evidence in um, some several um, extreme actions of racial violence in Kristallnacht, where um, German businesses, or excuse me, Jewish businesses and households were vandalized, attacked, set on fire. Um, the German pastor Julius von Jahn said that it was the responsibility of all Christians to stand shoulder to shoulder with their Jewish neighbors in a time of uh, crisis. And that was a declaration that ultimately got him beaten in public and imprisoned for his opposition. Um, following the T4 Aktion program, which was a euthanasia um, system in Germany to eliminate the mentally and the physically infirm, there was a um, minister by the name of August von Clemens August von Galen who said that, woe to the people, woe to our German nation if the sacred commandment of God that thou shalt not kill is not only violated, but tolerated and practiced without punishment. And so there were some very outspoken individuals who condemned the actions of the Nazis, but that didn't necessarily translate into empathy or activity in favor of the Jews that were being persecuted. And there was a lot of longstanding anti-Semitism in the origins of Protestantism in Germany at the time, Martin Luther being the, the founder of Lutheranism, which was arguably one of the most um, influential early pro Protestant movements, Luther saw Judaism as the antithesis of Christianity, that Judaism belonged in the Old Testament and Christianity belonged in the New Testament, that Christ came and fulfilled the old, so all of the, all of the Jewish customs were, were irrelevant, that Christ was virtuous, the Jew was dirty, Christ was selfless, the Jew was selfish. And so whether or not theologians in the 20th century acknowledge this, there was still teaching from Martin Luther evidence in their priestly training. And that was also coupled with the you know, centuries old 
perspective that the Jews were the ones who did kill Jesus. They were the ones who said, may his blood be in us and our, and our generations. So even though members of the contesting church especially were not actively um, um, promoting violence against the Jews, they were ultimately apathetic towards their Jewish neighbors. They said the Jews could have chosen salvation with Christ, but they rejected him. So some of this punishment is justified. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer himself was not without fault. He did um, echo some of the sentiments that the Jews were not Christians and that he had a responsibility to take care of God's flock, essentially. Um, that is one of the unfortunate realities of the confessing church is that they were so few in number that when Hitler, especially um, his um, subordinates, Heinrich Himmler and Joseph Goebbels, began to um, restrict freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, um, the confessing church members would tighten their, their uh, ranks and react to indifference to those who were outside of their fold. So if you were not a Christian, if you were not a Jewish Christian um, who was born Jewish but baptized into the church, then they couldn't help you. Essentially, it was each their own. Um, they had to worry about maintaining their, their grip and their validity uh, as, as ministers. Um, that is not to say, though, that there were not individuals across Europe, um, in North America, um, and the world over who were not dedicated to their call to love like Christ loved. Um, in, in the Gospels, Jesus quoted as saying that there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your fellow man. And there were some individuals who took that to the ultimate extreme. Um, in the Netherlands, the Calvinist population was a small minority. Um, it was only 8% of the religious community in the uh, Nether Netherlands at the time. But they were so willing to uh, oppose the Nazi discriminatory policies of deportation, of, um, of um, sterilization, of extermination, that they um, refused to turn over their Dutch Jewish neighbors. So 8% of the Christian population was almost single-handedly responsible for saving about 25% of the Dutch Jewish population. Um, there was one Protestant minister by the name of Bastian Adair, who personally saw to homing um, Jewish families in safe houses. He would provide false documents to allow them to assimilate into um, the Netherlands, and he would look for passage outside of the Netherlands to keep them safe from um, Nazi Gestapo agents. Um, ultimately, Adair was caught, he was imprisoned and executed uh, a week after his second son was born. So he paid the ultimate price in, in Christendom for um, serving those who were unable to serve themselves. Um, in Eastern Europe, there was a Hungarian priest by the name of Laszlo Rabatz, um, who was harbored out of Budapest. He um, also resisted the Nazi deportation of Hungarian Jews. He was so fervent against this that he wrote a series of epistles to the churches around Hungary, um, condemning the practice as um, abhorrent in the eyes of God. And he created such a stir among Hungarian Christians that um, the Secretary of State from Hungary visited him personally and told him that the deportation of Hungarian Jews would stop. Um, unfortunately, um, closer to the end of World War II, after the Nazis occupied Hungary, um, the decision was reversed, but Ravas was able to almost single-handedly, with the help of his, um, his allies, to put an end to the deportation of Hungarian Jews. Um, in the United States, in North America, um, while many Americans were trying to stay out of the war, there was one radio minister by the name of Paul Tillich, who was actively um, speaking out against the Nazi treatment of Jews in Europe. Um, he said that anti-Semitism, as it existed in the world, was abhorrent in the eyes of God, and that those who did not stand in solidarity with their Jewish neighbors um, would be subject to judgment by God. Um, these, these radio broadcasts were not only across the continent of the United States, they were also broadcast in Europe. There were transcribed editions that were sent into occupied Germany um, before um, sort of the crackdown on um, espionage in that, in that regard. Um, but it's important to recognize that while these individuals sacrificed a lot personally to, um, to stand up to Nazi oppression and to stand with their Jewish brethren, um, there's a danger of lionizing our heroes in history. Um, it was a, a term coined by the European historian um, Alison Eckert. This idea that we want to promote the brave and the courageous and the, the, the subtle acts of humility um, Whatever that may not really reflect the the broader um, the broader identity and the broader purpose. 
because following the, the Holocaust and the decades that, that succeeded it, um, religious members of communities in Judaism and Christianity and the world over um, struggled with the idea that a loving God could allow an extermination of six million innocent people to occur. And uh, emerging historiography really challenged this idea that religion itself can be active and masculine or passive and feminine in, in a subjective sense, that Judaism and the people who underwent and experienced the Holocaust survived in part because their faith was used to um, centuries of persecution. That the absence of God in a Jew Jewish person's life did not mean that he had forsaken them. It meant that they were to endure and they were to live on until God showed himself again to them. By contrast, European Christianity, especially in Germany in the 1930s, was seen as a passive religion, that Christians prayed to God for something to happen. And if God answered their prayers, that meant that his favor was among them. If he didn't answer their prayers, it meant that he was testing them in their faith. And so um, if the narrative had been flipped, some historians argue that Christianity would not have survived a genocide in similar scope to the Holocaust, that the, the need for Christians to um, have the validity in their faith that God is still favorable to them um, would have been maybe spurned by extended periods of suffering, and that many people would have turned away from their faith um, had the Holocaust been a kind of subversion of, of narrative. Um, another barrier to um, a strong Judeo-Christian relationship in the Holocaust in the centuries that followed was um, the exceptionalism of Christian salvation. So the notion that Christ is the one way, the one truth, the one light, um, and that the, the salvation came to the Jews and then the Gentiles, that the Jewish people were close to salvation. They were, um, they were on the cusp of acknowledging a Messiah, but they failed to do so. Um, it created a distinction between Christian Gentiles and Jewish, um, the Jewish pariah people was the, was the term used that um, perhaps if they would have listened to Christ and not, not um, ex executed, or executed him, uh, maybe the, the suffering wouldn't have been as, as immense. Um, and there also is this, this notion of comparative suffering, that there is an us, there is a Protestant suffering, there is a Catholic suffering that is equal to, in some ways, the Jewish suffering. Um, and this is, this is uh, an example um, that occurred in 1979. Pope John Paul II traveled to Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp to um, perform a homily to canonize Maximilian Kolbe, who was a Franciscan monk. Um, who volunteered to take the place of a man scheduled for execution. The man had stolen uh, a loaf of bread and a bucket of water to feed his family um, and was sentenced to execution through starvation and lethal injection. And Colbe uh, took his place, essentially. He and 10 other men were um, starved for two weeks, and then when they were all still alive at the end of those two weeks, he was um, killed through uh, lethal injection. So at the site in 1979, Pope John Paul II was mourning the death of Maximilian Kolbe as a martyr, um, as he also mourned the loss of the millions of Jews who, who passed through there. And um, some critics have argued that perhaps John Paul II wasn't as sincere in his homily as perhaps he could have been, um, because some skeptics argue that he wouldn't have gone to Auschwitz if there wasn't a saint to canonize there, that there had to be a caveat, there had to be a Christian who died there for the for the suffering to be validated um, and that's a a narrative that exists even today in some christian circles that we must we must pity the jews because they have been so close to salvation and we suffered alongside them in this period that was the holocaust um, but those who have hope, uh, thankfully strayed away from that, that narrative have seen a, a surge in the need for repentance and the need for redemption that we saw with martin niemuller and his poem there's the idea that um, healing cannot happen until there is an acknowledgement of guilt. And so the Church of Stuttgart, Germany, in 1945, issued um, what they called a blanket, um, a blanket apology, an acknowledgement of guilt, where they said both the church and its people apologize for not witnessing more courageously, for not praying more faithfully, for not believing more joyously, and for not loving more ardently. And so this was a first step in acknowledging a failure to act, a, a passive non-action um, non to help the Jewish people of Europe um, 
as a, as a stepping stone to, to further forgiveness. Um, and an issue that also arises with this is that many Christian people who, who try to rationalize the suffering of the Holocaust and try to rationalize the inaction of their Christian counterparts, they want to think that they would be the person to harbor a Jewish family, or that they would be the person to refuse to attend church where there's a swastika, or they'd be the person to proclaim on the street corner that, that God was watching the German people. Um, but Mordecai Paldel, um, a Holocaust and genocide survival historian and former director of the Yad Vashem, Righteous Among the Nations, pointed out that very few people want to acknowledge that Jesus and Hitler can both exist inside of them. They wish that they could emulate the virtues of Christ, but they don't want to acknowledge that they can also follow the teachings of Hitler, the, or the practices of Hitler. And so whenever an individual can acknowledge that they are at fault without providing caveats, without providing um, a, a justification for why they did or didn't do something, there can be healing, there can be redemption, is, is what Paul Dell um, rationalized this, this to be. Um, but I think returning then to Martin Niemöller's um, last lines that they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. Uh, carries a little bit of a different weight whenever we look at this as a um, confession of guilt and expression of remorse and an insistence for forgiveness, not just from other Christian believers, but from the people who were oppressed, the people who were murdered, the people who were ostracized, um, without a condition, without a need to convert the people who were oppressed, without a need to, um, to show that their spiritual um, condition is superior. But whenever it is a honest and humble need for forgiveness and a need for redemption, that that is where healing lies in the relationship between Protestant Christianity and the Holocaust. Any questions following the presentation? I have two. Okay. Great. So my first question is, do you, did you look into like the breakdown of Protestant groups in Germany? Like circa 19, like in the 1930s? I'm just curious if there was a. So like before there was like a, a rise in Nazi power or. Oh, it just in general, even even after the rise of Nazis, fine. But mm -hmm. I'm just thinking like in terms of which Protestant groups were most significant. So most of most of the sources that I found kind of had this like um, this kind of spectrum of were you confessing church or German Christian? Like I know in history we kind of simplify like that. There are obviously contingency groups that happened to people who were not really affiliated with either, um, but those were kind of the two major like pro-Nazi German Christian movements, opposition to Nazi confessing church, and kind of kind of that. So not group. like a breakdown by denomination or anything. Correct. Okay, um, and then my other, I guess it's more of a comment. Um, you were talking about that idea of the, of the Jewish people being this close to salvation, right? And how mm -hmm. Christians kind of perceived it that way. Um, the Lutheran Church, I don't know if you know this, in the 1980s had a really interesting development along those lines. Um, and that was to <laughs> change their theology to basically say that just because Jesus came, right, did not mean that it negated God's relationship or covenant with the Jews. So even though they started mm -hmm. off in this very anti-Semitic place, right. which they then will ignore for uh, a long time, um, they did kind of change their theology to fit that, but even mm -hmm. to go one step farther and be like, oh, well, they're still saved too because. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was. That was what I found in a lot of my research was that, um, again, that inverse relationship where um, if, you were, if you were concerned with protecting your theology or your doctrine or your, um, your denomination, it made it a lot harder for you to to worry about the people who were outside of your fold. Yeah. Um, so like like that Bastiana Dare, he was um, he was like what would be the equivalent of a deacon in the Calvinist Church, um, and so he was he was the hands and feet of that of that um, parish, that congregation, um, and so that was it was heartening for me to learn that there were still people who were willing to act out in their faith, um, but it was still frustrating to see that again the more the more dogmatic um, your approach comes, the less likely you are to have empathy. Yeah. So this might be out, this is going to kind of be outside the scope of your paper, and I apologize okay. for that. Um, but I'm wondering if, I'm just curious if there's, if, because you brought up places outside of Germany, mm -hmm. 
and I was just curious if, if, if there is any outside of sort of the theological, strictly theological explanations, if there are some historical ones, like I think they were from taking French history classes a long time ago, right? That, that, that there are, or like, for example, where Protestants were a minority in France, mm -hmm. so French Protestant communities that had their own history of violent persecution in France in like the 16th century. Oh, the he, yeah, mm -hmm. that that informed some of it about religious persecution versus religious tolerance. I'm wondering if that kind of thing comes up. It did, and that, actually that exact example was, I had it in my paper, um, I think. I had it in my research, and I don't know if I put it in my paper. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there, so, um, Poland and France were almost two extremes of tolerance or oppression. Um, Poland was one of the worst, um, the least amount of tolerance from, from Christian practitioners because they were predominantly Protestant and they didn't particularly care for their Jewish counterparts. But uh, the French population, um, some estimates say that about 75% um, in some like urban areas of the Jewish population was able to either assimilate or emigrate because um, again, those Protestant minorities knew what it was like in some sense to be persecuted, to be um, ostracized. So they were more willing to maybe provide some assistance. Those numbers that shift around when you talk about Jewish communities who immigrated after 1920, mm -hmm. some of it has to do with the I'm sure we'll learn about that in history. Working <laughs> that. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question about the Jewish community in France. The Nazi, pro-Nazi churches, uh, banished uh, non-Aryans. Mm -hmm. Who made the decision of who was Aryan or not, and on what basis did they make that decision? Well, I think it's um, <clears throat> a broader point too of how do you decide if somebody's Aryan or not. You know, there's that kind of pseudoscience of race and one's inherent Jewishness or non-Jewishness, um, and so the. Um, Dr. Scopo, maybe you can help me with the exact name of the, the committee or the institute that was dedicated to investigating race in, in, in Germany at that time. You know, it would just be like the Nuremberg Laws. Sort of right. There was there was there was an institution or a committee that was I again that was that was in my, my research. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, right? You need to know all the answers. Um, but they actually worked alongside the German Christian. Church, churches, and they received some support, some funding in exchange for um, giving the German Christian movement some, some weight. So I didn't come across anything in my studies to show who exactly made the decision. Um, but it was sort of, you know, if you could if you could prove that you were Aryan, then that gave you a favorite position in the church. And if there was something came out that your ancestors were not Aryan, you either kept that very, very under wraps or you found a new congregation to go to. So medieval letters and papers where you had to prove your ability to be able to participate right. in noble activities. One of the things that was interesting was that they gave, um, if you were a clergy member who was of Aryan descent and you had a family who was not, um, you could choose to either find a new congregation or basically revoke your, your status of, of minister. And so you wouldn't leave the church because of having non-Aryan family members, but you couldn't hold a high position of authority. So it was almost the do you do you cave to the pressure or do you stay in your congregation? So any other questions? Disagreements? <laughs> Threats? That's, that's rock. I, I would be really curious about the <coughs> going back to what David was saying, Mr. Ernst was saying about the denomination breakdown. Mm -hmm. Dutch Reformed Church. When you drive on Calvinists, I'm like, okay, so which ones? Which Calvinists are you talking right. about? Is there well, a denominator which Lutherans, which Lutherans, 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 Lutherans. Yep. Okay. Um, and, and as far as further research or further direction to prove that, take it another way, it, the alignment of denominational movements, because you have denominational leadership that will be making a lot of those decisions, at least in some organizations, mm -hmm. rather than individual, and other organizations say it's up to the individual congregation. Uh, at the congregational level. And so I'd be curious about how that would break down, how that broke down within Nazi Germany. And, so I would love to see that too. Um, I either missed that in the books that are- For the research. But for research, yeah. Because um, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly the breakdown that would be. Madison Barclays looking at the response of German Methodists to 
this graph thesis question. Might have all that all that true. <laughs> yeah, geography might have something, but this is I mean, certainly like the, the not Protestants, but mostly with Catholic responses in various places, it could it came down to diocese often mm -hmm. and whether or not your bishop was gonna say anything. Well, that's because the church's position is always been reactionary and not proactive. <laughs> that was probably, again, as somebody who grew up in a church, that was kind of disappointing that, you know, there were there were a couple sources that I found that suggested that if there was a more kind of like concentrated denouncement of the Nazi policies that Hitler might have actually backed down um, with the, the extra the euthanasia program, there was some accountability for that and they sort of scaled back some of their policies. So, I mean, I guess it's the, the history of hypotheticals in that sense, but it is history. It is history. 